Hello everyone. This time I'm going to talk about something that's related to my day job. I run uh, web servers and that sort of thing for an internet hosting company. And I see a lot of things uh, that you got to wonder what people are thinking. And of course I know that most of the people doing these things have no idea uh, what they're doing or that they're even doing them. The thing that came up recently was a fair number of queries about basically, they all basically boil down to, my website is slow. Okay, so it's a fair complaint and there's quite a few reasons your website might be slow. And that's what I want to talk about today. The first reason could be your hosting provider just sucks. It could be their servers are overloaded, their internet connection's overloaded, uh, or they just generally haven't got any clues to rub together. But it's usually not your hosting company that's causing the slowness. Another possibility is your home internet connection or the internet connection you're viewing the site on. Uh, that could be messed up somehow. Could, your local ISP could be interfering with traffic. Uh, there's quite a few reasons that could be messed up. And maybe you're doing a massive upload to YouTube and it's clobbering everything else. Uh, there's a whole raft of things that can go wrong from your the computer you're using to the router on your network to the actual uh, internet connection itself being slow. But again, this is usually not the reason that a website is slow consistently. Uh, and that is uh, something, it does contribute to the slowness you see, but it's something that's usually not the case. There's another possibility, and that's that the internet between you and your web hosting company is broken. And, you know, that is a possibility to consider, but it's usually also not the case and it will tend to be intermittent and it will tend to clear up on its own randomly. So it's something that while you should consider it as a possibility and be willing to accept it as a possible explanation, it's something that you can't test for really and you can't fix it. So uh, it, it's not really worth putting a lot of time into investigating. That said, you can pretty much rule that out as a problem if somebody else on, say, the same ISP doesn't have the same problem. In that case, you can pretty much narrow it down to your end of the connection. But let's leave all of that aside and let's look at, at reasons a website might be slow when everything is functioning properly. And believe it or not, this is the usual reason websites are slow. Okay, so the first reason that websites tend to be slow is that they reference external assets. Now, I should clarify what I mean by an asset. It's something that's, that, that is associated with the web page for actually delivering the content or the look and feel or what have you. An asset could be anything from an image to a JavaScript file to a font coming from Google server to that widget that lists your most recent tweets. All of those are assets. And they're often served from remote websites, uh, which is another issue altogether, and it should generally be avoided if possible. But for things like social media, widgets, and so on, it's probably just as well to do it the way they're doing it. But anyway, if these assets are slow to respond, then your whole website is going to look slow because it's going to take longer to render because your web browser has to go and fetch those from that third-party location. 
Now, it's not generally noticeable when you have, say, one or two of these third-party assets, as it's generally not going to cause too much of a problem. But I've noticed lately, websites tend to pile on these assets. Uh, one website where I got a complaint about was actually loading, uh, what was it, uh, 85 separate assets just to render the page. And about half of them were coming from remote locations. The other half were coming from the local server. And then there was a, one of them that was actually a bad link with a bad domain in it. And that was, is the one that's causing most of their page load delays because it has to fail to load before the page loads because it's a JavaScript reference. So, you know, these sorts of things you need to consider. Do you need these dozens and dozens and dozens of assets that you're attaching to your page? And odds are, when you really get down to it, you don't. Uh, realistically, uh, you probably only, assuming that you want to have the social media stuff and so on, you probably only need uh, the specific callouts to the social media integration widgets that are hosted by their content uh, delivery networks. Uh, you're probably, if you're using something like Google Analytics, you'll need to call out for that. Uh, and you need uh, whatever uh, images that your web page needs to display, but those should all be served locally uh, from the web server that your site is on. And maybe a JavaScript file or two for any fancy whiz-bang effects you're using, or what have you. But when you come down to needing 35 JavaScript files to load just to show your home page, well, now you're starting to get ridiculous. Now, I'm going to give a brief rundown on why having multiple assets tends to slow things down. The biggest thing is that your web browser can only ask for so many of them at a time. If it asks for too many of them at a time, the web server is going to tell it to piss off. Uh, it's, it's going to be looking like borderline abusive behavior from the web browser's uh, uh, IP address. And if you've got more than one person looking at the site from behind the IP address, suddenly you can find yourself getting blocked. So web browsers tend to keep the number of simultaneous connections to the web server to a relatively small number. Now, it's, it's not just that which delays the loading of assets. There are schemes that uh, modern web servers and web browsers use that can streamline that uh, by reducing the number of times a new connection has to be made to the web server to get an asset. Uh, and that does make a big difference when you have to download a lot of small assets to show a page. So a lot of small JavaScript files and so on. Now, the reason it helps is because every request to the web server has to happen over a TCP connection. Now, a TCP connection requires a three-way handshake. Now, what that means is your web browser, your computer, has to send a, hey, I want to connect packet to the web server. Then the web server sends back a, an acknowledgement of that, and you know I won't get into the details on that. Um, it's not really important, but you get another packet comes back, and then when your computer sends the last packet of the handshake back to the server, now you've established two-way communication, and at that point, your request starts flowing. Now, uh, there are ways to streamline this, and they do help, but the the gist of it is to do any TCP connection, no matter how small the data transfer is, it takes about three times the transit time between your machine and the web server. And in all likelihood, it's going to take more than that. But every single connection 
has to do that same three-way handshake. And if you have any distance between you and the web server, so like the web server's on a remote network, like it usually is, you're looking at anywhere from 40 to 140 milliseconds for a round trip. So you're looking at, you know, something like a fifth of a second to actually get that request even flowing and then you have the time it takes for your uh, asset to get to the web browser and that varies based on how big it is but once the connection set up the data tends to flow a little bit faster now you still have the issue where if that round trip time is large then subsequent requests are still going to take longer than if that round trip time is small. Which is why if you're testing uh, your website on a local server or on your local machine, which has almost no round trip time in this case, your website may perform perfectly fast and adequate and blindingly fast and blaze along, but as soon as you put it up on that remote web server, it takes five seconds to load. And that's all down to how many times a request has to go back to the web server. So having multiple uh, assets needlessly will slow your website down. Uh, at least on the first, re first load of a page on it. Subsequent loads will tend to be faster because the web browsers do cache these assets and that's done for two reasons, to reduce the amount of traffic going back to the web servers and also to speed up the web page experience because it knows it just downloaded that image, it doesn't need to get it again. Okay, so you have all these assets and you have all these three-way handshakes that have to happen and then if you have third-party servers in the mix where you have no control over the performance characteristics at all, well, it can get random uh, where your website, your web host server may be up and running and running perfectly fine and even blindingly fast, but if those third-party assets are slow to respond, it can slow your whole web page down. And that's the reason you want to avoid these types of things, if at all possible. Now, it's not always possible, depending what you're doing, but you shouldn't add extra ones that you don't need. Okay, so the number of assets is a problem, but it's not necessarily a substantial one, depending on the assets. If you're using assets from Google or Facebook or Twitter or so on, they're likely not going to be slow to respond most of the time. And if you're using a stacks of JavaScripts and so on served from your local web server, they're probably going to get packaged up relatively efficiently and they'll come down relatively quickly using the modern uh, keep alive multiple requests per connection technology in the web protocols. Now we get down to another huge problem and that's the total size of the assets required. Now let's just look at the total assets required as served from the same server as your web page. One site I looked at required 40 megabytes of assets to download to show the home page. 40 megabytes. Well, a little back of the envelope calculation says that on a 25 megabit internet connection, that's going to take 15 or 20 seconds. Potentially. Uh, because it all has to come in that 25 megabit per second pipe. Now, it, to, uh, for the back of the envelope comparison, I'm figuring 10 bits per byte. And that's not too far wrong because there's signaling overhead on the wires. So your... So if you have 10... If, if you have 40 megabytes, that's 
400 megabits. And that has to come down over your 25 megabits per second connection. It doesn't matter whether these are coming from third-party locations or the same web server, they all have to come down through that same 25 megabit per second connection. So we have 400 megabits coming down uh, when accounting for uh, overhead, uh, is signaling overhead. Uh, and your connection is 25 megabits per second. If you divide 400 by 25, you get 16, right? So that's 16 seconds just to download all of those assets. And this site operator wondered why their site was slow. And it was entirely due to this massive pile of assets that they needed to download to run their site. And now, most of these assets happen to be images. And what they've done is they've taken pictures with their camera at four or greater megapixels and just put those up unmodified and used CSS to scale them to fit the web page. In other words, they did something truly stupid. But it's something that the uninitiated don't understand. They don't know that they're doing something stupid. So you can see how it happens. Now, in that case, it was an easy fix. Resize the images so they are sane, and, uh, uh, close to the size, to, uh, you know, at the size they're being scaled to, and poof, the website started loading reasonably quickly in uh, under half a second. Uh, and that made all the difference. Another site uh, loads four megabytes of assets. So on that same 25 megabit per second connection, that's going to take a second and a half, about approximately minimum, to download. So that's going to put your minimum time to render the page properly at a second and a half because the data has to come. Now, a second and a half is a long time for, to wait for a page to render. Now, now, this is all assuming that the person viewing the web page has a 25 megabit per second connection, uh, that they're actually getting that nominal speed on their connection, that, that that is actually what they have. And while that's a pretty common speed in a, a lot of areas, it's very common for that effective speed that people are getting to be much lower than that in the 10 megabit per second range. Uh, so, you know, multiply that one and a half seconds by two and a half, and now you've got a real substantial delay in loading the page. And it's enough that people will get bored and go elsewhere. And that is one of the big reasons that web pages these days are slow. It's not necessarily how long it takes to gather all of the information to put together the web page at the server side, although that can take some time. It's the size of the nonsense that comes down with it in every request. Now, it is... Uh, reasonable in some cases that you have this large amount of data traveling around. So uh, you need to actually consider what your web page is doing. If you have a graphics heavy page, then you're going to have a lot of images that have to be downloaded to fully render the page. But if the page is structured properly, it can render the browser can render everything else and then fill in the images as it manages to download them. So just because you have a lot of assets to display your page, it doesn't mean it takes that entire 10 seconds or whatever to actually render, uh, to actually render something that will keep the user interested. But a lot of these pages are done in such a way that if one of these that these assets have to load before the page can render. Uh, for, for instance, with images, 
you often need the image before you can identify the size of it to actually slot it into the page. And that will mean that the web browser really doesn't know what to render until it gets that. On the other hand, if that image is contained inside a box that has a fixed size, or a size that the browser can identify without the image, then it can actually go to work rendering everything around it and render the contents of that box when it has enough information. So there is an aspect to designing your, your web page where you need to consider the load times, uh, consider how long it takes to deliver the assets and in what order they're actually required. Uh, for instance, if you have a JavaScript that is, say, Google Analytics, say, it's tracking uh, the, the web page accesses, you don't necessarily care if that JavaScript fails to load or it loads slowly. Uh, instead, you would uh, much prefer the page to render and display quickly and then have the, uh, that non-critical asset be called for. And you can do that by putting that analytics code at the end of the web page as opposed to the beginning. Because then, you know, is with JavaScript on, uh, you know, he, this is just uh, an example of things, but with JavaScript, when you put that script tag there to load a JavaScript, rendering stops there until that JavaScript is available, and then it continues on. It actually inserts that script right in there, and because it needs to execute immediately. Now, if you put that at the end of the page, after the browser has all of the information on the rest of the layout, it can render everything up to that without that JavaScript necessarily having to delay rendering the page. Now, there are some wrinkles there, and uh, I've glossed over a lot of the intricacies there. I'm not even clear on some of them myself. But... Generally, a web browser will try to render what it has as soon as it can. And that's just sensible. Now, this isn't necessarily the only stuff that can slow your web page down. There's one more massive category of things that really, really slow down the web page delivery. And this is entirely on the server side, but it's not necessarily the fault of your web provider, your web, web hoster. Every request against a, a database serv server, like MySQL, slows down your page delivery time. Every dynamic thing that your website code does slows down your website your web page delivery time. Now this isn't necessarily a problem if the person submitting the request or requesting the page is expecting it to take a while. But a lot of pages, that's not the way it works. Now uh, it's just, it's the home page on a website and you want that to be as quick as possible. Now I see a lot, uh, with hand-done websites and so on, you don't see this a lot. But people using toolkits and content management systems and application frameworks tend to trip on this a lot. Uh, they'll end up... Uh, uh, they'll end up using some sort of a content relational model or something like that, where they, they wrap their database tables in classes and an object relational model, I guess. And they'll, they'll use these classes and the, to access their data in the database, and they don't understand that necessarily that the way that they're doing it, they might be generating 30 or 40 or 50 queries to the database server to do something that looks simple. 
and to do something that could be done in one or maybe two queries to the database server if the person exploited proper joins in the SQL statements being sent to the web, to the database server. Now, just like requests to the web a website web server, these requests to the database server have to go through that same TCP three-way handshake usually. Now, now, fortunately, usually you'll have one connection back to the database server at the start of the web page processing, and then all of the re subsequent requests will be fed over that same connection. And usually, the database server is going to be on the same network or the same machine as the web server, and that will reduce a lot of the delays associated with it. But if you ever build a web page that calls out to a remote database server, expect that to substantially slow your web page delivery time. Uh, I had one case years ago where the, the customer had implemented into their uh, web application on a server they had co-located on our network a relational database call back to a server at their office network. And then they kept complaining to us because their page delivery time was slow. They kept insisting that we weren't providing the bandwidth that they were paying for. Now the problem, once I did the math and worked out how what the round trip time to their server and their office network was, and all of that jazz, I worked out that the absolute minimum page load time with a perfect network from us to the viewer, that is no delays there at all, I worked out that the minimum possible page load time was 1.4 seconds once you added up the round trip and so on needed to establish the connection to the database server and the size of the data that was being transferred. And once you worked out the internet speeds at their end, and it turned out it was their, that remote callout that slowed their page delivery time noticeably. Now, fortunately, that's usually not the problem. But if every request that you have to make to the database server has to send the request to the server, the server has to do something with it, and then it has to send the result set back to you. And even on a fast local network, that takes non-zero time. For one request or two requests, it's not necessarily going to be appreciable. Uh, it, it'll probably disappear in the length of time it takes someone to let up the button on their mouse. But when you, but multiply that by 10 or 20 or 30 or 40, and I've seen web page deliveries require 100 plus database queries just to build the web page. Once you start adding up like that, you can substantially slow down your web page delivery even if the database server keeps up perfectly. So you need to do something to reduce the number of database queries that have to be done to generate your page content. Uh, ideally, you should get it down to zero or as close to zero as possible. Now, one or two is probably reasonable if you can get down to that. And ideally, these requests should be read-only queries. Read-only queries can run in parallel on the database server. If it's an updating query, if it's changing the contents on, of a table, that has to be serialized so you don't have multiple updates screwing things up at the same time. Uh, and here is one of the big offenders in slowing websites down and overloading servers. Using the database server to store session information which I see all the time with, from idiots using Drupal. You should never, ever, 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 ever use the heavyweight relational database server for your session data. Never. Don't do it.
you're going to generate a lot of churn on that database. And you're going to generate a lot of load on that database server. And if you're wondering why your web page can't scale to hundreds or even uh, simultaneous viewers, that will probably be why if you're using a database server for your session tracking. And the reason for that is every request has to make an update query against the session data in the database. Update queries are necessarily slower than read-only fetch data queries. So don't do it. it it's just, it's going to overload things and it's going to, if you've got a really busy website, it's going to piss off your website hoster. And, you know, while website hosting companies like those busy websites that pay them for bandwidth and all of that jazz, they are likely to tell you, please take your business elsewhere if you are causing trouble for their infrastructure needlessly. Uh, another culprit in these uh, massive queries against databases is uh, using things like Drupal and putting up all of these dozens of widgets all over your page and each one of those having to make a query against the database to build its content. While it looks brilliant to have all of these nice little fancy gewgaws all over the page with all this information available for a single click and everything, most of your viewers, in most cases, most sites, not all sites, but most sites, they don't care about all of the information. They'll happily do one click through a menu to get to it instead of having it all in their face on a page that needs a four foot wide monitor to view or a three foot tall one. So think about that as well before you start adding dozens and dozens and dozens of dynamic content all over the place on your pages. But this isn't necessarily all bad. Uh, you can substantially mitigate a lot of this with caching. And I'm not talking about caching at the web server level or in your web browser, although that does help. I'm talking about caching pre-rendered pages or pre-rendered chunks of content in the case of all those flashy gewgaws all over the place. If you do that, then it's a relatively quick check against the cache to find out if that page has been rendered recently. And if it has been, just deliver that instead of re-rendering it. Now you have to be careful when you do that, that stuff that needs to be dynamic stays dynamic. And to get any real benefit from this, you have to minimize the amount of dynamic nonsense on your pages. So avoid stylizing your pages to say, hello, Fred, and things like that. Just don't do that on web pages. It's simply not worth it. Or find a way to do that that doesn't mean that the entire main page can't be cached, especially for your home page. If your home page can't be cached, you're going to really slam your server, especially if it's a busy page. Now, an important point here is even caching in the database server is still better than no caching at all because now it's a read-only query. You're fetching information instead of updating it. Uh, so if you're running multiple front-end web servers, maybe there's a benefit to doing that. But better yet, you should be caching it on the web server itself in files. It's much faster to access a local file than to request something from a database server with extra protocols and so on. So if you are doing a caching scheme, use local files. And that will also scale much better through with multiple front-end web servers because then every front-end web server has its own cache and it can substantially reduce the load on the database server infrastructure, which is expensive and difficult. So you've got that. So you've, you've got all that worked out. So you've got caching, 
uh, and you verified it's working properly, things are expiring properly, things are getting rebuilt properly, all of that jazz, and your site's still slow. Well, you may just have one of those sites that can't be sped up. But, you know, you, you should really look, look at reducing the size of your assets that need to be delivered, uh, reducing the number of queries against the database. Like, look at all of that to see if you can speed everything up. Now, I see some of these recommendations for things like uh, PHP opcode caches and so on uh, for things like Drupal. And, and you know, apparently it does help because it means PHP doesn't have to parse the scripts all the time and compile them on the fly all the time. And if you have a really, really busy site, you will definitely get a win from that. Uh, but it does require a certain type of PHP structure on the server. Uh, you can't do the opcode caching if PHP is running as a CGI script. Now, a lot of uh, properly implemented uh, hosting servers that use PHP will be operating it in CGI mode so that they can execute the scripts as the specific user that the script belongs to instead of running it as nobody or whoever runs the web server. And by doing that, you actually reduce a lot of security vulnerabilities because now you no longer need world writable files uh, and so on in order for uh, dynamic stuff to work on the server side, so file uploads and things like that in your content management systems. And it also means that you can have things like WordPress be able to update themselves without giving the entire world on that same web server the same right access to the files that WordPress needs. Now that's just asking for trouble, so don't do it, right? So, yeah. That's all well and good. Uh, but if you happen to be in a situation where PHP can benefit from an opcode cache, uh, for things that use a lot of code, and some of these big content management systems use a lot of code, uh, it, yes, can be a benefit. And there, there are ways of doing it that do help. Uh, so you should, you know, at least if you, you think that it'll help, you should talk to your hosting provider. Now, if they tell you they cannot do it, do take their word for it. Don't insist that it has to be done. Look at what you're doing uh, and see, is there anything you can do to improve things? Now... Uh, now, I've talked about a whole bunch of technical things that cause things to be slow. Um, and while dealing with these technical things will help immensely, the question comes down to how do you deal with it? Well, uh, let's take a look at a couple of more concrete examples. My personal uh, website runs WordPress. I think I have five plugins in there. And uh, it generally loads pretty quick, even when the server's busy. And that's because it's a relatively simple static theme and it loads up relatively simple content. It does use the Google Ads gimmick, AdSense, uh, so that can slow it down. But it doesn't put up dozens of these fancy gugas. It doesn't have an infinite scroll JavaScript going. It doesn't use a rotating banner uh, or any of that fancy stuff that's all the rage these days. And it generally loads pretty quick. It also doesn't require five dozen images and ten, ten dozen JavaScripts just to render the page. And it's amazing the difference that can make. On the other hand, uh, a website that I, uh, I have some uh, experience and involvement with uh, does use a whole bunch of these extra widgets, and it uses them to pretty good effect for the most part. 
but it tends to load quite a bit slower on average because of all the assets it has to load just to show the page and because of all this fancy dynamic business that's going on. And there's other sites that have the same issue because they have all this dynamic large business going on that tends to slow things down. Uh, there are some ways to mitigate that. The total data size might be reduced by enabling compression on assets. Uh, things like that, so that it's actually smaller data going across the wire, it'll download faster at the expense of some CPU time on the server and the web browser. Uh, and, you know, things like that. But the biggest thing you can do to speed up your website is remove all of the nonsense you don't need. That means removing modules in your content management system if you don't need them, remove them so that they can't contribute to excess code and slowing things down. If a module is enabled, its code has to load any time you request a page. And if you're going to do that, uh, it better be a module that you're using. If you're not using the module, there's no point enabling it and having it slow everything down. Uh, so removing these modules helps. Turning off features you're not using on the website if you have an option in your themes or modules. Turn off the features you're not using so they don't try to actually run, you know, if it's at all possible. And if it is a feature you're using, think about, about it hard. Do you need to use that feature? Is it really beneficial to your web presence? Anything that you can determine is not really beneficial to your web presence, you should turn off. The less stuff that you're running on your website, the less likely it's going to be slow. And the, the fewer modules and stuff that you're loading just to run your website, the less likely the server processing time is going to be slow, and the less likely you're going to create a query storm against the database server. Okay, so I've gone on at great length here on why web pages tend to be slow. And I've really picked on the site operators as the prime culprit in the slowness problem. But in fact, the prime culprit is the purveyors of the crapware that people use in their content management systems. Base WordPress, for instance, is reasonably snappy. It works pretty well. Base Drupal works reasonably well. Uh, Joomla, it's terrible. It sucks bad. Uh, but even Base Joomla works reasonably well from a performance perspective. Uh, it's when you start adding all of these add-ons that things start getting slow. And you start overloading things. And that's the thing to really look at. And it's not add-ons and plugins that are necessarily bad. Uh, if they're providing a useful feature on your website, it's probably worth investigating them. But you need to make sure that it, it is a focus plugin that does what you need and doesn't add a whole bunch of extra layers to everything to, and slow everything down further. If you don't need stacks and stacks of dynamic everything everywhere, don't install a plugin that turns everything into stacks and stacks of dynamic everything everywhere. That's going to slow things down needlessly. So that's really, you, you need to think about what you're installing. And you need to actually look at what you're installing and find out if it's actually competently built and whether, or whether, you're just installing bloated crapware that slows your site down. Uh, you know, that's what it comes down to. Like, you need to make sensible decisions. But sometimes you as a site operator don't have the sensible options. So the purveyors of this crapware out there really need to step up their game and start providing proper stuff that isn't you know, bloated crapware that slows everything down, like actually implementing things sensibly.
Uh, that said, a lot of the stuff that is out there is going to slow things down by its very nature. So you still have to make that, de that decision yourself. Now, finally, I want to mention that web server operators are not necessarily entirely blameless if your site is slow. There may be circumstances that are beyond your control that maybe the hosting provider can do something about. Uh, if their server's overloaded, maybe they can do something about that. Uh, if, uh, if they've got one customer on the server that's causing problems, maybe they can do something about that, like throttle that customer uh, uh, if they're causing trouble, uh, you know, things like that. But things like that will tend to be intermittent rather than consistent. Uh, so if your site is intermittently slow, it's really hard for anybody to troubleshoot it. And it's really hard for, say, the server operator to troubleshoot slowness that you're seeing that they aren't. So if they come back to you and say, I can't see the slowness, I can't see the symptoms, so I'm not sure what's causing them, don't just assume you're being blown off. They Maybe they can't see it. And if they can't see it, uh, it may be that the problem is not on the server side. So just keep that in mind. But also keep in mind that uh, there are things, especially if you have a shared hosting environment, which a lot of people have, other users in that environment can cause deleterious effects on your website. That's why your shared hosting costs are lower than running your own web server yourself or having a dedicated server generally. Uh, that's, that's why, is because you're sharing resources. Uh, even if you get a dedicated virtual server, you're sharing resources, so you need to keep that in mind. That's why these things are so much cheaper than buying your own server and putting it in a data center. Uh, keep that in mind. Uh, so remember, you're not paying for perfect performance all of the time. You're not paying for 100% uptime, which, by the way, is impossible. Uh, you're, you're not paying for this. You're not paying top dollar for your shared hosting. It doesn't matter how much you're paying for it. You're not paying top dollar. So keep that in mind when you call up your hosting provider and bitch them out for slowing your website down. Uh, and just keep in mind that while, yeah, they may have, there may be something they can do, Remember, don't start, start with the, I'm paying top dollar or I'm paying good money for X. Make sure you understand what you're actually subscribed to before you do that. Yeah, just as an aside. Anyway, as you can tell by the length of time I've gone on on this topic, what causes a website to be slow is actually not straightforward at all. So... You make sure to do proper investigation when you do encounter that. Uh, and uh, if you need to, talk to experts. And don't assume that Google, a Google search, gives you the right answer. Uh, anyway, that's it on this topic for now. If there's uh, additional information you want me to talk about on this or... Uh, you want to scream at me because I've got some information completely wrong or whatever, uh, leave a comment on the video here. Um, unless you're obviously spammy, I'm not going to block it. So, uh, you know, if you want to be critical of what I'm saying, go for it. Uh, just be polite. And uh, if you want to be notified of future videos, uh, go ahead and subscribe. And if you've watched it this far, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.